And thank you for that brilliant introduction, Steph. Uh, my name's Dave, and until quite recently I used to work for Microsoft. Uh, I invented a job title which I believe in so much I took it with me. I was the Chief Envisioning Officer. Check me out. Right? There's a reason why I chose this job title, because I'm a lifelong technologist. I've spent my entire career working in the technology industry, and the thing I figured out is the most important thing in the technology industry is not technology, it's the humans that use it. And my job is essentially to help customers understand the kind of technology they're going to require in the future. And in order to do that, we don't look at the technology, we look at how a human being is going to want to live, work and play in the future. Because if we understand where the humans are, we know what the technology is that they're going to require. So understand then, at a certain level, my job is essentially about the future of humanity. Right? <laughs> and I just figured if I'm going to have a job about the future of humanity, I deserve and I demand a job title with a certain degree of pomposity. I think you'll see I've achieved that. Um, and so I would love to tell you as part of this job that I spent all of my time, I work with academics going through research papers, looking at industry trends, working with industry giants, but the reality is if you really want to know what I do for a living, what I do for my clients, you just have to ask my wife. Because whenever we're out somewhere, somebody will in everything, she's like, what does your husband do? She just looks at me and scorns and says, him? He just talks bollocks for a living. <laughs> anyway. So I got really frustrated working in the technology industry because all we wanted to do was to talk about ourselves. We just wanted to talk about the technology. We just wanted to talk about our products. And I don't think that's the most interesting thing. I don't think that actually helps our customers achieve more with technology. So I set out to try and reset our relationship with technology to refocus the conversation. I started writing books. And the first book I wrote was called Business Reimagined. It's about how the way we work today doesn't actually work. And it's based on a few reasons. The first is this, it's the rate of change of technology in both our personal and professional lives. Now, you're all related at some point to the technology industry, you're all familiar with this beautiful, lovely curve that we love so much in the technology industry, the exponential curve. This is actually my favourite ever exponential curve because it plots the number of mentions of the phrase exponential growth over the last six decades. There is no better articulation of the kind of world that we find ourselves in today. So the technology is fundamentally changing more quickly than ever before. But our problem is we haven't changed. We, the humans. And the challenge is that we are locked to this thing called productivity. We think productivity is a great definition of how successful we can be in the world of work. But the real issue with productivity is it's a definition of productivity that goes back 200 years. It was forged in the fires of the Industrial Revolution. We think productivity is actually about efficiency. It's about output per unit of input. And the problem is that we create our organisations based on a series of standardised interlinked processes because that's what makes us efficient. And over a while, over time, all that becomes important to us is the process of work, not the outcome of work. So I might be working on a production line and my job is to make widgets for the car. Why this is the gesture for making widgets, I don't know. I've never made a widget, but maybe this would be the gesture that would be involved. So I'm making the widgets and frankly, you're paying my salary on the quality of my widgets. I couldn't give a stuff whether the car coming off the production line is any good as long as the, my widgets are the best widgets this company's ever seen. I will be okay. This is terrible in terms of the outcome of the organisation, but what's worse is that by creating an organisation based on a series of standardised interlinked processes, you create an organisation that will resist change. If the market changes, if the economy changes, if the customers change, the only way you can respond to that change is to completely break apart your organisation and then reassemble it. So this fixation on process is holding us back. But when you even look at the processes themselves, you realise that many of these processes were actually invented, designed in the 19th century. The way we structure our organisations, exactly the same, designed in the 19th century. All we do today with this amazing technology, this technology that will fundamentally change the world, is we use it to use those, those old-fashioned Victorian working practices a bit quicker and a bit cheaper. This is not the potential of technology, and we have to change that if we want to achieve more. So I followed that up with another book, and this is a book I'm going to spend a bit more time on today. It's called The Rise of the Humans, and on one level it's about our personal relationship with technology, and on another it's about the coming storm, and it's a coming storm of big data and artificial intelligence. These are things that will disrupt every industry, every organisation, every individual will be completely changed by what this technology is going to do. Now look, there are two things that you need to know about my books. Number one, I am a relatively cheap date. So you can actually get these books for free on Amazon. If you have a Kindle, you just download them from there or tweet me and I'll send you a download code. But perhaps the more important thing for you to know about my books, um, and I'm always a bit uh, sort of embarrassed to have to uh, confess this in public, but look, there was a time in my uh, past life where I was a bit down on my luck. Um, 
had to do some things for money I'm not terribly proud of today. Uh, look, I was a management consultant, okay? <laughs> As a result of being a management consultant, you will find no answers in my books, because I was a good consultant. But what you will find is a series of provocations, challenges for you to think differently about how you use technology. And the rise of the human speaks to the world that we live in today, a world of too much information. I call it the digital deluge. We walk around and we complain about the fact we have too much information. I was in a roundtable conversation earlier this, today with, with you, and some of you, and you basically said, we have too much information, we've got too much. What a brilliant problem to have, we have too much information. And then we complain about it like it's a new problem. You know, something that the internet has brought to us. Well, actually, I would argue since the invention of the printing press, our society has had access to more content than any single human being could consume in their lifetime. The fact that today, thanks to the internet, we have ten times more, a bazillion times more, it doesn't matter, right? We still have too much. But the thing that makes it problematic for me, the thing that makes the issue is actually these bloody things. These beautiful, gorgeous, engaging personal devices that are with us from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep. Because thanks to them, we now have access to too much information wherever we are, whatever we're doing at any time of day. Now, be honest, two amongst you, first thing this morning when you woke up, check your phone. Last thing at night? Yeah, right, and we all do it, yeah? But the challenge for me as a technologist is I look at that and I see all of the greatness that this technology could live up, bring our lives, but in reality, most people still live here. Quick random sample of this audience. Who amongst you does not get enough email? <laughs> Now, I don't even have to write a punchline to that joke. We get the problem, right? This was not what we were supposed to do. As technologists, we were supposed to liberate people. We were supposed to help them think differently, be free about how they work. So I'd love for you for the next 45 minutes or so to come on a journey with me. I want you to break through this barrier. I want you to realise that unless we fundamentally change our behaviour as human beings, this concept of working smarter, just why you have to be from the northwest when you say that, I don't know, but it just feels right, you know. Working smarter. Anyway, <clears throat> it's completely unobtainable. The only choice we're going to have left is to work harder. No, I don't know about any of you, but I've reached that point in my career where the concept of me continuing to work harder, that's not what I sign up for. So if we could, for the next 45 minutes, see if we could break through this barrier, start to see the potential of technology in a really different light. And it starts in a really dull place. It starts in a world of data. Now, we're all used to data. Your organization is awash with data. The customers who use your services, they generate data. But the problem with how we think about data today is we treat it like it's a byproduct of our core business. You run your facilities, you have customers come in, and as a result, you get some data that's left behind. And maybe once in a while, you'll scoop up that data and you'll use it to reflect on what's happened and what works and what doesn't work. Well, we're going into a place where your ability to use that data, not to reflect on what's happened, but to use it as a strategic part of your business. I think data will ultimately become the fuel of all of our businesses. And your ability to create a renewable, sustainable supply of that data to power you forward is fundamental to your future success. Because when you have data, and in particular when you have lots of data, your view of the world will fundamentally change. Here's my favourite example of this principle in action. When you have lots of data, you start to see the world in a very different light. Here's an example. I've got two cars here. I've got a Toyota Prius and a Land Rover Defender. <coughs> Which of these two vehicles is better for the planet, more environmentally friendly? Put your hand up if you think it's the Toyota Prius. Put your hand up if you think it's a trick question, the Land Rover Defender. <laughs> Put your hand up if you want to be a management consultant, and you know the answer is, well, it depends. Right? Because it does depend. It depends on how broad a view of data you use to, take the, to, to answer the question. What we would typically do as organisations is we take the easy route. We take the data that we've always already got, the data that's easily to hand. Well, let's look at fuel consumption. Well, of course, if we look at fuel consumption, the best of this two, these two vehicles for the planet is the Toyota Prius. That thing runs on water and pixie dust, hugs trees when you drive by. Not like the Defender, 22 to the gallon, not a good day. Well, the Americans, they took a different approach to answering this question. Back in 2008, they did a survey, a study called Dust to Dust. It was a big data study. And basically what they did is they looked at from the creation of the components that go to make the vehicle through to the point at which the vehicle is thrown on the scrap heap, the best of these two vehicles for the planet is actually the Land Rover Defender. Now, why? Because over 67% of every Land Rover ever made is still on the bloody road. You cannot break these vehicles. Trust me, I have tried several times. And if you do break them, you can fix them at the roadside with bubblegum and bailing twine. Now, look, the point of this example is not to advertise Land Rover cars. Although if any of you have got any connections and they're looking for sponsorship opportunities, obviously I'm available. 
The point here is, look what happened to the answer to this question when we added more data. The answer fundamentally changed. There is not a question that you are asking of yourselves as individuals, as a team, as an organisation, that will not fall prey to exactly the same principle. Your job is to get as much bloody data as you can. You should be smothering yourselves in data at every available opportunity because your view of the world will change. But you have to be careful. We're going to go into a world, a world of lots of data, and we're going to be tempted, seduced even, to grab disparate bits of data, to mash them together, to gain insight. But the problem is, unless the data is in some way related, we end up in a world of spurious correlations. This is a dangerous place for our society to be. This is a problem that is so acute that there are lots of people around the world who are quite worried they're doing some good thinking. This is my favourite. This is a professor from the university, from one of the northeast uni uh, universities in, in the States. And he's so worried about a world of spurious data <coughs> correlations, he started producing a few of his own. And this is my favourite. What he's done, he's taken two really important data sets. The first is the change in the average surface temperature of the Earth. And he's plotted that against the number of pirates <laughs> operating in the Indian Ocean. And what he's found based on his research is that there is a 98% correlation between these two data sets. And his research proves, if you look at the chart, as the number of pirates operating in the Indian Ocean dwindles, the average surface temperature of the Earth increases. 98% yeah. correlation, right? On the basis of this evidence, I would put it to you if we truly care about this planet, if we really want to save the planet, it's not renewable energy we need, it's neither wind nor solar, simply more pirates. Arr! <laughs> this is a dangerous place. So when you are in that world, when you're surrounded by data, what you've got to do is to make sure that the data is properly related and then we can avoid <coughs> silly mistakes like this. But the point of all of this data is actually the gift is yet to come. This is where we move away from a world of reflective data use, where we use the data to understand what has happened, and instead we enter a world of predictive data use. This is about the ability to understand what will happen in the future. Now this is not some half-baked down the pub on a Saturday afternoon who's going to win the 320 at Chepstow prediction. This is statistically significant prediction. Companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft have been doing this for years. In my time at Microsoft, I was involved in a few of the projects. We predicted the last Football World Cup, we got 15 out of 16 World Cup games right. We did the Scottish referendum, we got that right within 2% of the public vote. We did uh, Pop Idol, X Factor, and even, this still is the highlight of my Microsoft career, the Eurovision Song Contest. Oh, yes. And we're getting it right. And these companies who make these algorithms, they're making the power of these algorithms available to everybody. It's just a service you call from their cloud. You point it at your data. And the question I need you to think about at this point in the presentation is how would you run your business? How would you run your organisation? How would you offer your services to the public in a world where you can predict what will happen rather than reflect on what has? And whilst you don't need to answer that question today, you're going to need to answer it soon because the ability to do it is around the corner. Now what's making this possible is something that I like to call a technological Copernican shift. Because, like many geeks, I spend far too long on Wikipedia looking for obscure phrases. A Copernican shift is essentially in 1534, Copernicus, he rocks up to his academic buddies, he says, you buggers have got this all wrong. It's not the sun that goes around the earth, it's the earth that goes around the sun. And in that instant, everything we knew about the world around us got completely turned on its head, fundamentally shifted. I would argue that same shift is about to happen with our relationship with technology as human beings. Because if you think about it, today... We humans, we gravitate around the technology. Every time you want to use technology, you have to go to it. You have to pick up your phone, you sit in front of your computer, you sit inside your car. But we're fast emerging in a world where the technology instead surrounds us. It's embedded, imbued into every uh, floor tile, every light bulb, every wall, every window, every surface is a device that is connected and spewing out data about the world around us. The floor tiles, for example, will know not just how many times they've been stood on, but how many times I've stood on them versus how many times you've stood on them. And if we add to this ocean of data, this cacophony of data, a layer of ambient intelligence, these are algorithms who work on our behalf as individuals to understand, to make sense of that data. They use their innate <coughs> personal knowledge of us as individuals to make sense of that data. 
Now you're already doing it today. If you've got an iPhone or an iOS device, you'll be familiar with Apple's Siri. If you use uh, Android, you'll be familiar with Google Now, Google Assistant. If you use Windows or Xbox, you'll be familiar with Microsoft's Cortana. These are all ambient intelligent agents. They use their personal knowledge of you to, to deliver value. And you may have had this experience, things like, I know that Siri does this, Cortana does this. They, these things, they know where you are, right? Because that's where your phone is. Siri knows where I am because that's where my phone is. Siri knows where I'm going to be next, not because it's psychic, because it looks in my calendar. It's kind of obvious when you think about it. Right? So it looks in my calendar and it says, oh, your next appointment is geographically different to where you are right now. And because I know that, I can go and monitor the traffic outside and see if the traffic builds up, then I need to interrupt you, tell you to leave earlier than you'd planned. Simple, simple examples. But the things that they do is going to get deeper and deeper and more pervasive into our lives. Think about what you could do from a personal assistant perspective when it comes to health and well-being. How you could advise people about kind of exercise. This is the world that we're emerging into. Now what's making this possible is probably, well, it is what I would argue is the most important technology that anybody on the planet is working on today. And it's a technology called machine learning. Now, some people, they talk about it in the context, they call it artificial intelligence. Those two things are actually slightly different, but for the sake of argument, let's call them the same thing. All machine learning and today's artificial intelligence really are is the ability to spot patterns in data. It's statistical-based pattern recognition. And I would bet you will remember the first time you ever became aware of this technology. You wouldn't have known what it was called. But it would be the first time that as you were going using a search engine, as you were typing your query, before you'd finished typing, the search engine has suggested the very thing that you're about to type. And if you're a bit like me, you were like, bloody hell, that's weird. I'm looking over my shoulder. Who's watching? Statistical-based pattern recognition. The search engine is simply saying, based on the characters you've just typed in, and against the three and a half billion queries that have been typed into me today, the statistical probability of you going on to complete the sentence like this is 99%, so I'm going to suggest that as the next option. That basic ability to spot patterns in lots and lots of data enables us to build services that will fundamentally change not just our relationship with technology, they will change our relationship with each other. They will even, in the fullness of time, they will change how we even define what it means to be human. Here's an example of one of these services. This is using the power of machine learning to deliver real-time speech-to-speech language translation. This is a real product. So the lady's putting in earbuds. The earbuds are connected to a phone, which is connected to the internet. As the gentleman speaks English, she hears French. As she speaks French, he hears English, real time. No human beings involved other than those two. Nobody's doing a translation. <coughs> Think about the transformational nature of this kind of stuff. It changes the world. I've got an 11-year-old son. On the basis of this technology, do I bother to get my 11-year-old son to learn a foreign language at school? Because by the time he enters his world of work, it will be a redundant skill. Now, I get that's provocative. I get there are lots of reasons why we learn foreign languages at school. And of course, my son, he'll learn one or two languages just like everybody else. But as a result of technologies like this, as he emerges from his education, he will be able to speak not just those one or two languages, he'll be able to speak another 152 languages fluently. He will be able to travel the world communicating with locals as if he were a local, which will fundamentally change his cultural experience in his life, not to mention his job prospects. This is going to change our world, and we have to get ready for it. It's such a big change that even the computer scientists are excited about it. And if you've ever met or worked with a computer scientist, you know it takes a lot to get them excited. The computer scientists, they talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning in the context of the third computer age. So just for completeness, the first computer age is the world of the analog computer, the mechanical computer. This is a world personified by Charles Babbage and his analytical engine, a design so complicated, Babbage never finished it in his lifetime. It took the Science Museum until 2006 to finish it. We're all familiar with the second computer age, which is the world of the digital microprocessor, the phone in your pocket, the PC on your desk. But the third computer age belongs to artificial intelligence, and it's different from these first two ages for two really, really important reasons, <coughs> two things that we've really got to understand. The first is that unlike today's computers, I do not program algorithms. I do not instruct them what to do. Just as a silly example, if I want to get a computer today to walk through that door, I have to give it line-by-line -line instructions, code-by-code. Code. I have to tell it where the door is. I have to tell it what kind of door it is. Does it push? Does it pull? Is there a handle? All of those bits of information need to be there. If I fail in any one of those instructions, the computer will fail to walk through the door. In order to get 
an algorithm to walk through the door, the process is completely different. All I have to do is I show it a million videos of people walking through doors and it learns. It's like our children, they learn from our behaviour. And the brilliant thing about this is this is actually how human beings learn, which is a bit counterintuitive or contradictory to the way that we think we learn. And it's based on this principle that was proved by some research from somebody in Cambridge University at, at, in the late 90s. And the research basically showed if you speak English, and if you don't, this works in whatever is your native language, as long as I keep the first and the last characters of the word in the right place, I can mix up all of these. Even misspell words, and you will still be able to read the text. Can you read the text? So the thing about this, what's really curious, is that we actually think we learn language at school because we're taught the rules of language, we're taught the logic of language, we're taught things like I before E except after C. Do you remember that one? Well, the interesting thing about the rules of language is they're completely bogus. Do you know the I before E? Well, there are 923 exceptions to the I before E. There are more exceptions to the I before E rule than there are to the bloody rule itself. Language isn't logical. It doesn't follow rules. It follows patterns. And we innately know this as human beings because from the day you learn to read until the day you die, you create, curate, and tend to your own personal pattern of language. Every time you read something, you're making your own personal pattern of language slightly better. And when your brain gets presented with us something as ambiguous as this, it doesn't call on the rules, it doesn't call on the logic, it calls on your personal pattern of language and it uses the pattern to reassemble the words. This is exactly how algorithms work. And the challenge with this is actually, it shows you, it's a good example because it shows the limitation of today's machine learning, today's algorithms, because they're only as good as the patterns that they've been provided with. What do you think happens when I show this slide to somebody who's just beginning to learn to speak English, or if I'd shown it to my son, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when he was just forming his own language skills? Can't read it. Makes no bloody sense because you haven't established enough of the pattern. So that's the first really, really important thing, because what we now are in, we're in a world where the algorithms learn from us humans. And the problem about learning from humans is we're not perfect. And you'll see lots of things in the press about the bias of algorithms. It's not the bias of algorithms, it's the bias of the data, the training that we use to teach them what to do. So that's the first thing about the, the, second, the, the third computer age. The next thing is that finally, in the third computer age, we move away from one of the fundamental principles of computing, which is that of binary. In today's computing, everything is a one or a zero. It's yes or it's no, it's black or it's white. This is not true in a world of algorithms. In a world of algorithms, there is only maybe, there is only a probability. When you type in your query to a search engine and you see that first blue link, what you're seeing is not a perfect answer. You're seeing what the algorithm thinks of as the most likely answer in the least amount of time. It is a probability. And whilst that's okay today, because we're making pretty trivial decisions on this information, which restaurant should we go out to, which mountain bike should I buy, increasingly the decisions we make based on these probabilistic determinations will become more and more important to our lives. I think it's entirely feasible in the next five years I'll go to my GP and my GP will say, do you know what, Dave, there's a 68% chance you're going to get prostate cancer. What do I, as a human being, do with a probabilistic determination like that? How do I determine the right course of action against something that is ambiguous as a probability? And it gets worse. We'll go further and further into our lives. I think it's entirely likely that my son will choose his lifelong partner on the basis of a probabilistic determination. So one of the things, one of the core human skills that we've got to start to get better at is about living with that kind of ambiguity, is about that kind of critical thinking. So the algorithm says this, how do I know that's the right answer? What course of action should I choose? And it's this reason that we should stop all of this silly rhetoric that we have, and particularly in pop culture and the media, where this is about some big adversarial battle. You know, I talk about robots, and there's a picture of Arnie and his titanium robot army. We talk about artificial intelligence, and there's something about 2001. Sorry, Dave, I can't do that, right? These are not helpful images, because the world that we're moving into isn't humans versus machines. It's actually humans plus machines. What is it, given that the technology can do all of this, what is it that I can now focus on because I've got more capacity than I have? What are the bits that the computers can't do today? And the best bit in all of this, again, has nothing to do with the technology. It's actually all about the humans. And as much as we would love to say that we suck at change and we find it hard to change, the reality is we do change. When somebody creates a service or a technology that adds value to our lives and is consistent, we change our behaviour. And actually, it changes our expectations. And there are lots of examples that play out in our lives at any moment in time. My favourite is this one, actually, because this is happening right now. And my bet is how you react to this situation in public has probably changed within the last 12 months. Would you say that's fair? 
Yeah, lots of nods. How would you re react to this? You're paying for your coffee or your newspaper, what do you do? You tap, yeah? 12 months ago, four digits. Does anybody know when contactless payments was first introduced to the UK? 2008. This is how long that change takes to go through, but it does happen. What has to happen is it has to be reliable. It has to be consistent. I have to know that I'm going to get that service. If you want to know how digitally enabled you are, what's your reaction in this scenario when as you approach the cashier, I've got a little flourish and everything, and just as you're about to tap, the cashier goes, don't do contact us. <laughs> that's like the worst thing that's going to happen for me. That like, What? Are you caught? Is it 24? Oh, come on. Four di oh, God. That's because my expectations have been driven. And the point of this is that when you're planning services, you're not planning for today, you're planning for tomorrow. And you're planning for expectations of your customers that are growing every single day. Every time one of your customers has a good experience somewhere else, they then use that to measure your performance. There's a lovely story of this at work. This actually played out last summer on social. And this is a story about a normal, everyday human being. Well, all right, he's a DJ, but you take my point. And he's travelling, it's a long train journey, he's travelling from Glasgow to Sheffield. And he gets on the train and he realises he's made a fundamental flaw in his travel arrangements, right? It's early in the morning, he's up early, he's a bit hungover, it's 11am, right? And he's on the platform, he gets on the train, oh man, it's no buffet car, I'm hungover, I'm hung what am I going to do? And then he thinks, hang on a minute. Hey, he's a DJ, right? I've got me a big social following. I'm going to tweet my posse. There will be someone from my posse. We'll be on a platform between here and Sheffield. They'll pop into the shop, buy me a sandwich, and they'll bring it to my train. Turns out he's not that popular. <laughs> but then he realises that, hang on, I live in this amazing world. I live in a world where I have real-time information on my location. The train company tells me exactly where my train is. Curiously, Domino's have the equivalent service for their pizzas. <laughs> Domino's knows where all of their pizzas are. In this amazing world of digital interconnectedness, it should therefore be theoretically possible that I should be able to triangulate my position with the location of the pizzas and have pizza delivered to a moving train. This is exactly what he sets out to do. He figures it all out. He triangulates his position. Darlington is the sweet spot. Well, it's probably the only sweet spot that Darlington has, but that's okay. No offense if you're from Darlington. It's a lovely town. He's there. Look at his, you know, so he orders. Look at his happy little DJ face. Look at this. I'm going to get pizza on a train. He gets the confirmation text. The train starts to approach. It starts to slow down. It approaches the station. The brakes go on. And look at what happens. Oh, there we go. Yes, Thank you very much. That's for you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Now, I have watched that video hundreds and hundreds of times. The bit that just makes me smile every single time. It's the expression on the faces of the Domino staff. It's like they do this every single day of their lives. <laughs> But look how smug this guy is, right? I would be this smug if I just had pizza delivered to a moving train. What a brilliant thing. Now look, the point of this story is not just because it's a great story, and it is a great story. The point of this story for me is this guy is a regular, normal, everyday human being. He's one of you. He's one of any of the people that exists outside of this room. He's one of your bloody customers. And he sat there and he thought, you know what, I live in this amazing world where I have all these amazing experiences at my fingertips, typically through the window of one of these devices. In my world, it's theoretically possible that I can connect all of these disparate pieces together to deliver value to me. And your job as service providers, you've got to anticipate people like this. You've got to think about what is it that they're actually trying to do? What is it I could do to make that successful? And part of the challenge for me is I think we have to think about it in the context of that weird desk toy that your dad used to have or your mad uncle, the Newton's Cradle. And every now and again, the technologists like me, I have to come along, I have to tell you, do you know what? There's this new technology out there and you kind of need to check it out, contactless payment. And I need to give you a little gentle nudge to say, go and have a look. And if I do it right, if I add value and actually you get it right, then guess what happens? You come right back and you give me the equivalent nudge. That was brilliant. Now I want more but you have to deliver value. If you ever get to a point where it's technology for technology's sake, you will fail. 
Let me give you an example. I drove here today, but typically I'll take the train to where, where I'm going. Train companies are the classic example of just everything that's wrong with people trying to go on a digital journey. If I go to buy a train ticket online, it's like a 27-step process. I have to pick up my device. I have to tell it where I am, where I'm going, when I'm traveling. It brings me back seven options, all with different prices and different rules. You know, one of them I have to stand on one leg, the other one I need a white cat. It's just completely bizarre. Right? Then I have to put my credit card in, then it sends me some email, and then the next day I'm at the station, I'm there with my laptop bag and my bacon sandwich and my coffee, and there's a ticket machine, and I go to the ticket machine, and it wants my credit card again. Okay, have you had it once? Please enter your six-digit confirmation code. Oh, shit, where's that? Oh, God, it's... A, oh, God, I'm now like some cack and it's, uh, Meanwhile, while all of this chaos is going on in the corner of the ticket office, behind a wall of glass, is a lovely lady. And all I have to do to the lovely lady is I have to say, excuse me, I'd quite like to travel to London today. It's a single conversation, it's a single transaction, I get my ticket and off I go. Do you think I'm ever, ever, ever going to use the train company's app again? Of course I'm not, because it adds no value. And so when you think about the digital journey of your customers, think about what is it you can do to make their lives simpler. So look, what can you do with this? How can you apply this into the things that you do, the organisation that you have? There's some pretty straightforward principles for me that the only way that this works, the only way that you can do any of this stuff is, number one, you have to digitise your business. Every single asset in your business needs to exist as a digital asset. Now, I'm not just talking about the physical things. I'm not just talking about the equipment or the tables or the computers. I'm talking about the intangible things. I'm talking about things like the knowledge that your people hold. I'm talking about things like the way in which the knowledge flows through your organisation. Who are the people that ask all the questions? Who are the people that answer all of the questions? Who are the people that come up with all the ideas? Where does that knowledge come? If you can light up that, then you've got something that you can innovate with. And the best bit about this, and this is back to this whole principle of data being the fuel of your future, is that we live in a world where it's getting easier and easier to light up the invisible data that exists in your organisation. We can make the invisible visible. We're actually doing it to ourselves already. Anybody know what this is? It's fitness data. It's actually a very specific kind of fitness data because it's actually the fitness data for my dog. <laughs> this is Meg. Uh, have we got any dog owners in the room? A few. Okay, so the dog owners amongst you will notice, curiously, that Meg is a Border Collie. And if you know your dogs, you'll know that Border Collies are essentially the sociopaths of the dog world. <laughs> Meg is at one end of the, the spectrum. <laughs> And Meg's challenge, we, we rescued, we adopted her and her sister last year, and Meg's challenge is that she basically thinks that all human beings are sheep, right? And frankly, after last summer, I'm not sure she's wrong. Any bit of politics. Um, and so the problem with Meg, when we take her for a walk, yeah, we'll get there in the end. Okay, as we walk with Meg, she is so worried about the sheep, the human, straying from the path, she will do the entire walk backwards. Did it this morning, three miles, backwards. And she is locked on as I'm walking, and she's doing this. Now, I got quite worried as a responsible dog owner. I'm thinking, well, is she getting enough exercise? She's a border collie. Oh, my God, what do I do? And meanwhile, her sister's running around chasing rabbits, doing all the things that dogs do. But I can't visualise that. I can't quantify that. So the only choice I had as a geek, as a nerd, is, of course, I'm going to quantify I stick a device on her collar. Now I know exactly what she's doing. I've got a third one since then. I'm bloody knackered. Right? But now I can, because I can visualise the data... I can start to quantify and I can decide the right course of action. We do this to ourselves as human beings. You all in this audience in particular, you must have had one of these devices, yeah, a personal health device. I, I love this device. It tells me my heart rate. The thing I love about my heart rate is that pretty much more or less give or take, I've always had a bloody heart rate. It's always been there. It's just that now I can see it. Now it's visible. Now I can look back in time and I can see, oh God, look, every time I meet with my boss, my heart rate spikes. What's that about? This principle of lighting up the data for us humans is as true for your organisation as it is for us individuals. <coughs> if you want to take the right course of action as an organisation, hell, the conversation we were just having in the roundtable is exactly this. If you want to take the right course of action as an industry, you've got to light up your data. You've got to start to use the data to visualise, to quantify where you are now and what, what behavioural change that you're going to instigate to get the result that you're looking for. It means that all of you in your organisations, you have to create what I call a data culture. Because the thing is, in the past, data science was something that was relegated to the maths and stats gigs. It's hard work, it's complicated stuff. 
This is less and less the case because companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and others, they're making tools that light up the value of your data in a really simple way. You just press buttons in Excel and it gets extracted, but you have to know what questions to ask. You have to know what kind of data you need. And that only comes when you've got a culture of people who understand how data fundamentally works. And there are some principles here about sort of really understanding in a digital society, in a digital world, what is it that you need to do to deliver experiences that change people's lives for the better, about delivering transformational experiences. And I think there's a really simple way of thinking about it. If you want to deliver transformational experiences for the people you care about most, and typically these are the people who are either using your facilities who are not using your facilities but should be, you gotta remember you can only do it if you have access to two things. Number one, everybody in your organization needs to be empowered to be transformational. Everybody needs to feel like they can challenge things, come up with new ideas, try new things. And then you've got to remember that those people will only ever be successful if they have access to the tools that enable them to work in transformational ways. You will not be. I promise you, no matter how hard you try, you're never ever going to be transformational over email. Right? Not even as an attachment. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> And a lot of this comes from thinking in a digital world, it is about connecting with that person, the customer, and it's about thinking about what it means to be them. And in the past as organisations, what we're really used to do is we think about what it means to be us. We write things like our mission statements, which are essentially a love letter that we write to ourselves. I love you, I love the way you do things, it's really good. It means nothing to our customers. But instead you've got to think about what does it mean to be a customer of this organisation? What does it mean if I'm going to use the facilities that you have on offer? What else is going on in my life? And I think of it in terms of thinking not inside out, but outside in. And let me talk to you a bit about an industry that I think continues to get this wrong, because I think there's some lessons that we can learn from it. And if I just use a little prop here, does anybody recognize one of these? You know what this is? So this is a voucher that I get given from my favorite grocery retailer. And to me, it's symptomatic of all that's wrong in how we think about customer journeys and customer loyalty in, in particular. Because the way this works is that I will go to my grocery retailer of choice, I will get my groceries, I will go to the checkout, and as I go to the checkout, this weird process happens. First of all, I have to give the cashier two pieces of plastic, credit card, points card, that's a bit weird, why can't it just be one? Okay, fair enough. And in return for two pieces of plastic, the cashier gives me two pieces of paper. One of them is my receipt, and the other one is this piece of paper. Now in the eyes of the retailer, this piece of paper is true Customer loyalty. This is their reward to me for over 20 years of loyal customer service. Because on this piece of paper, it will basically say, Dave, we love you. We love the fact that you have chosen us above all of the other people that you could have got. You chose us. Again, we love you. Because we love you, we have a duty of care to tell you that if you'd gone somewhere else, you would have saved £2.63. <laughs> but because we love you, because we care, and we want you to come back, we're going to give you that £2.63 back if you come back in the next seven days. <laughs> and if you bring this piece of paper with you. When the retailer gives me this voucher, there is a maternalistic look of pride on their face. We've got your back, Dave. We love you. What do you think of the look on my face? When they give me this piece of paper, my reaction, you bastards! <laughs> As a gentleman of a certain age, I am barely lucky if I can remember my own name in the morning. Never mind to bring a bloody piece of paper with me seven days from now, you're mad! Well, if you really cared about me, as a retailer, if you really truly cared about me, what would you do? You would understand, like everybody else on the planet, I'm actually a bit preoccupied with some other stuff. You know, shopping for my groceries is not the most important thing in the world for me. So, if you really want to make a difference to my life, just give me the £2 bloody 63. Don't make me jump through hoops. This is our opportunity when it comes to digital is to <coughs> anticipate that our customers, they don't think about how our organisations work. They don't think about the structure. They don't think about the principles of what we have to apply. They have their own goals in mind. And your ability to anticipate those goals and to be there to facilitate them <coughs> is the thing that's going to make you special. Which leads me to this, which is the most important principle of digital. Now who's going to admit they know who these people are? <laughs> Come on, who is it? Who is it? Thompson Twins, oh, sir, oh, get your coat. Yeah, oh. You're barred. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I heard it down here. Where was it? Oh, no, 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 no. 
Banana Rum and Fun Boy 3. Fantastic. Who, uh, this is the, for, the, for, the, for the youngsters in the audience, this was the height of British pop. How patronising am I now? There's a height of British pop in the mid-1980s. And this particular outing of Fun Boy 3 and Banana Rum had a hit with a, a cover of an old song called It Ain't What You Do, It's The Way That You Do It. Yeah, you see, you know the answer, right? This is the most true principle in the world of digital. If you think what makes you special is the equipment you have in your facility, or the facility itself, you are dead wrong. There are a million other places I could go that would have equivalent facilities for more or less the same price. The bit that's going to make you special, the bit that's going to make people want to come to you, is how you choose to provide that service. This is something you must never lose to. Don't get me wrong, your equipment and your facilities are important. You can't be in business without them. But it's the way you deliver the service. That's the bit that will make all of the difference for the people you care about most. If you can focus, when you think about your future provision, spend more time thinking about how you provide the service than the service itself. And within that, wean yourself off a world of efficiency. In a digital society, efficiency is useless. <laughs> I can make the best widgets in the world. If the car is crap, does it matter? Instead, you should think about effectiveness. What is it for us to be effective? And if you start with what's effective and then work backwards, then you can end up in the right place. But that means about focusing on outcomes, not process. And this is not what you think it is. <laughs> this comes from, a, a, I was doing a customer uh, engagement a few years ago and I was in Birmingham of all places and uh, I was outside New Street Station it was very early in the morning uncharacteristically early for me I was about six o'clock in the morning uh, I'm there obviously trying to impress the client being on time and I got a bit of time to kill so I'm walking around outside uh, New Street Station this is when they've got all the construction going on and I came across this guy right council worker high vis jacket He's walking down the middle of the street, right? Not the pavement, not the pedestrianised bit, but where the cars are going. And he's putting white powder, dollops of white powder, at regular intervals down the street. Now, I'm a curious guy. It's early and I've got... ...time on my side, right? So I'm like, what are you doing? And he just looks at me and says, well, I'm putting down elephant powder. That elephant powder, what's that for? Well, it keeps the elephants away. And I'm like, but there aren't any elephants in Birmingham. And he just looks at me and smiles. He says, I oh, know, it's good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I'm here all week. <laughs> Your organisations, my organisation, everybody's organisation is filled to the brim with elephant powder. Shit you do that is completely redundant, irrelevant in a modern digital society. This is the stuff that holds us back. This is the stuff that prevents transformation. This is the stuff that is locked into the procedures and the rules that nobody even knows why they were there, but they're there. When you go around the organisation, you say, hey, why do you, why do you do that like that? And they say, well, because we've always done it like that. That's elephant powder. And our job, if we want to change the provision, if we want to change what we, we do and what we mean to the people who we care about most, but employees or, or our customers... We have to get rid of elephant powder. We've got to. I want you to all come on a collective crusade with me to rid the world of elephant powder. And then the final part of this is we have to change the way we think about the future. And this is one of the things that's really quite hard for human beings because we tend to live in this place where we have always, pretty much, we've thought about the future being a straight line. The future is always a straight line. And it's a straight line extrapolated from where we are today from where we were yesterday. And it's always up and to the right. In a digitally connected world, in a digital society, the future is never a straight line. The future bounces around like a pinball, and your ability to anticipate the ricochets of the pinball is your ability to be successful. Again, let's look at an industry that's struggling with this. This is an industry that thinks about the future as a straight line. Does anybody know what this is? This is the first ever autonomous vehicle that's been approved for use on UK highways. You will see these on the streets of Coventry, you'll see these on the streets of Milton Keynes, and you'll see these on the streets, I think, of Bristol. And I love them as an example, right, because on one hand, just phenomenal to think that we could live in a world where this kind of technology would be possible, that we could make drive, like, wow, isn't that amazing? But then on the other hand, you start to look at the reality, the numbers of things. And the numbers basically will show that it won't be until 2040 that 50% of all miles driven will be driven autonomously. That number doesn't hit 100% until the time we reach 2070. 
Do you seriously want to tell me that by the time we reach 2070, we will still think the best way to transport human beings around the local environment is inside a tin robotic box on wheels? That cannot be the case. If Amazon is preparing to deliver packages to my house using autonomous drones, if Domino's are going to deliver pizzas to my house using autonomous drones, surely the future of transportation is as likely to be one of these as it is to be one of these. But the automotive industry can't see that because we've always had cars. We've always had them. And before then, we had horses and carriages. We're always going to need them. Do you know that they are actually trialling these, and won't be these Airbus ones, but a similar one. In this year, 2017, there will be trials of driverless, autonomous taxi drones in Dubai. This is how close this technology is. But there are other challenges with this kind of thinking about the future. Um, the regulators, the, the, the legislators, the regulators have problems with this. Do you know what the first law we passed in the UK for the provision of autonomous highways and uh, the autonomous vehicles in UK highways? Is that there must be, at all times, a human being inside the vehicle. I don't know, let's call them the driver, right? <laughs> Whose job it is to monitor the madness of this thing. But look, the real issue of this thinking is not about the regulation, and it's not about the fact that we... It's about the opportunity cost. Because for every second that an automotive engineer is thinking about how we build one of these, nobody's really thinking about this. But more importantly, nobody's building this. <laughs> this is what we want. As human beings, this is the solution. And that thinking holds us back. <laughs> so let me leave you with two things. Let me leave you with, number one, a perspective on technology. And we saw this today in the roundtable discussion. Let me tell you right now, as a technologist, as a lifelong technologist, technology is the least important problem you face. It's not irrelevant, it's the bottom of the pile. You've got so much other stuff to do. And I can think of no better way of articulating this than to call on a quote from Pablo Picasso, of all people, who basically, it's the mid-60s, he's being interviewed by some art magazine in Paris, and what he would ask Pablo Picasso this question, I don't know, I wasn't there, but they basically said, hey Pablo, what do you think about computers? And even though the computers in Pablo's mid-60s <coughs> Paris are different to the computers we have in our pockets and on our desks, his answer was brilliant, because it's still true today. He just said, computers? Computers are useless. All they can give me is answers. What I need is something that can ask the right questions. And ladies and gentlemen, that something, guess what? It's you. That's your bloody job. Your job is to figure out what is the question that we're actually trying to answer. As an industry, as a company, as a team, if you know what that question is, we all know the technology will make short work of the results. So to bring this all together, please understand, this is not my view of the future. The internet is not Skynet, it's not the Terminator. I have a very different view of the future. And it's simply this. I just want a world where we, as human beings, we can stand tall, high and proud, right up on the shoulders of these digital giants we've created. We can use technology to extend our reach, not to replace us. And the thing I love about this debate, we've been having it for years, for decades. I remember when I was a kid, I was doing my maths exams at school. I was doing my maths O-level. If you don't know what an O-level is, it's kind of like a GCSE, but harder, right? <laughs> it was a point in our lives where we were debating the role of pocket calculators in the education of our children. As a result of that societal debate, I did my maths O-level with a logbook and a slide rule. Now let me tell you, I'm actually a better mathematician with a calculator than I am with a tabulated bit of paper and a slidey bit of plastic. Yes, I need to know the basics of arithmetic, but once I do, the technology fundamentally lifts my capability. It's exactly the same debate today. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that every member of our organisation and every member of our society has access to the basic <coughs> skills that light technology up. And these are not skills like whether they can use Word or PowerPoint or even specific coding languages. These are fundamental human Human skills, skills like critical thinking, skills like deep thinking, creative thinking, the ability to communicate and collaborate, the ability to keep each other safe online. If we make sure that every member of our organisation, every member of our society has access to these skills, then and only then can we as human beings rise up and live up to all of the opportunity that technology has to offer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.